Hey, what's up, Rattlers? So when it comes to the New Caledonian geckos, of course the crested geckos and the lichianas are the most well-known. Well, right underneath that are the Chihuahua geckos, and they are really gaining in popularity. So I'm right back here at Kyle and Crystal Saltzman's place, and you guys may remember I filmed an episode here a couple of years ago on his crested geckos. Well, now the majority of their collection is Chihuahua geckos. Well, I'm back here again at Gekonidae's Geckos here in Wisconsin, and in this video, Kyle Saltzman is going to show us some of his amazing amazing Chihuahua geckos. I'm Dave Kaufman and I am obsessed with reptiles. So come with me and join my reptile adventures. At Rainbow Mealworms, we grow all our insects 100% naturally so that you get the freshest, most lively feeders on the market. So for all your reptile food needs, place your order today at rainbowmealworms.net. All right, Kyle, so the last time I was over here, this room was full of crested geckos, and you've kind of changed direction a little bit into Chihuahua geckos, which is now the most prevalent gecko that you have down here. Uh, for the most part, yeah. Um, we, I, th I believe we have 26 or 27 pairs of Pine Island Chihuahua. Um, there are a couple different locales, um, and then there's the recognized uh, Jalu now. These are some of our adult... Um, uh, breeders and or grow outs. Um, this one here is a grow out. This big girl is one that we produced ourselves. They can be a little bit jumpy at yeah. first, but for the most part, they're a very personable, personable gecko. But um, they're pretty, pretty docile for the most part. I mean, we just cup these for to be able to show you, but um, for the most part, they're sleeping during the day. So when you wake them up. At this time around noon, they like to jump around and they're a little bit uh, squirrely. Yeah, but look at the colors and the patterns on these. I'm so surprised that these aren't more popular or just as popular as crested geckos or lychees. They're starting to become that way, honestly. There are a lot more people that ask us about them. I think that the biggest thing is still the value, the cost. Um, people are a little bit leery, uh, wary, whatever, about shelling out the amount of money that uh, are on the price tag for these guys. When we first started with these probably 13, 13 14 years ago, um, you could buy a sub adult for a few hundred dollars. Right. Um, you didn't have the bright, bold white collars. You didn't have the crazy colors and stuff like, like this back then. Um, and even this one isn't as colorful as some can be. Um, there are some that are very, very white. They have a lot more patterning, different colors, grays and whites and pinks, peaches. Some people really are into the grays and greens, but they each kind of have their own price tag. And an adult female, even right now, could go anywhere between a couple thousand to, as crazy as it sounds, 20,000 plus. Um, For a single gecko. Currently. So do you have a $20,000 gecko here? I, I don't believe that. <laughs> we do. um, we've got some that are definitely in in the multiple thousands of dollars. All right, so this girl right here, if somebody wanted to purchase this girl, if she was for sale, what would what would a gecko like this run? Um, we probably wouldn't price her online for anything less than 7,500. 7,500, all right. Um, this is another one that we produced out of one of our uh, more high color and high white pairings. This one is ending up very pink and peach um, with the white collar and some like white hips. But this one is still maybe only about a year old. So she's got some, a little ways to go as far as coloring up and size. And something like this could go for about that same value, 7,500 to maybe even 10,000. All right, so that female's a year old. At what age do Chihuahua geckos usually reach breeding maturity? Um, for us, it takes about two and a half to three years. Um, it really depends on how heavily you feed them, how, about, how many insects, um, how warm you keep them as they are growing, um, and then they, they may grow a little bit faster. Um, Pine Island, Chihuahua, I wouldn't breed anything less than 50 grams. Most people wait for 55, 60 grams uh, in size and two and a half to three years old. So it takes them about two to three years to get to that 50, 55 grams. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, like I said, some people can get them to grow a little bit quicker, but it seems like here in the upper Midwest, things grow a little bit slower. I, we do know other breeders that, um, I don't want to say they have a problem um, getting them to grow quickly, but they grow steadily throughout that uh, that uh, two and a half to three year range, um, right. and then they you know they reach maturity. 
So a big girl like this girl, I mean, she's huge. She's over nine. She's over 90 grams. Um, this is uh, Noel. She's not top top end that we've ever seen, but she's one of the biggest ones that we own ourselves. And what did you say? She's 90 grams. Um, like 92 to 94 grams usually. Um, typical size for an adult, uh, either female or male, they're about the same size at adulthood, is between probably 65 and 75 grams. That's pretty typical for a pine island. That is an amazing gecko. And how old is this one? This one has to be probably seven or eight, I believe. Seven or eight. I would say that the part of the issue for us with uh, raising them up and their growth rates is that here they take about a between 140 and 150 days to incubate. So once they do actually hatch, it ends up being late summer moving into fall, and a lot of them actually hatch in the winter for us. So a lot of a lot of our hatchlings, whether it's crested geckos or chihuahua or any other species that we work with, when it hatches in the winter, it, it tends to have a little bit slower growth. It's, sure. it's a little bit harder of a start for them. So on the topic of breeding, this is how you're incubating your chihuahua eggs? Uh, correct, this is just a fishing tackle tray. Um, that we can divide each um, clutch of eggs and we just let them sit for the five months that they need to incubate. This is simply just uh, the Rapashi Super Hatch. Uh, you can use um, the Aquarium Pond Clay, um, any type of um, pebble or stone or even perlite or uh, vermiculite that holds moisture um, for an extended period of time. This stuff is easy to use just because you mix it with water um, you can tell that it's drying out, um, you can see the color change, and then you can add a little bit more water. Um, for the most part though, all we do is we drop the eggs in uh, and let them incubate for however long they need to go. And are they like crested geckos where you just kind of put them on a shelf and yep, incubate absolutely. them in the room Yep, so we incubate uh, between 70, 72, 74 degrees, um, somewhere in that range, and that's what, uh, that's what we end up with. There you go. These guys actually are different than most geckos. These lay two eggs every two months instead of two eggs every, every month. month. And like I said, for us, the incubation is long, 140 to 150 days on average. Um, some people elsewhere in the country, they might, uh, they might get them hatching around 100 days or so. Um, but it, tend, it seems to be that the longer they take, um, the more robust the hatchlings are um, and healthier. Gotcha. So we, we very, very, very rarely have any kind of issues with hatchlings. All right, so down in these setups here, you just had a female lay a couple of eggs in there. Yep, and for the most part, um, Chihua, they don't, they're not barriers. I mean, you will have some that'll dig into the substrate and they'll bury their eggs, but for the most part, they'll find like a little nook, uh, nook cranny, crevice, whatever to tuck them into. Um, in this case, uh, she decided to lay them underneath her water bowl. Underneath, all right. So she dug just a mini hole, which is one of the first times I've seen her actually bury eggs. Um, but you can see the egg down there in the soil. So for us, this is not necessarily typical. Um, usually they would um, tuck them behind a branch or a log or in, even into like a small crevice in the cork bark. Gotcha. But they find the best place that they feel um, to lay eggs and they'll tuck them in. And that's where they go. Yeah. All right, so let's move on and talk about caging. I love your cage design and your setups here. They're just kind of basic enclosures with basic furniture, sticks, and silk plants. And what, Talk a little bit about why you use the silk plants instead of the real plants. Um, for the most part, we tried uh, real plants uh, for quite a few years. And for how robust the Chihuahua is, they just dis destroy They destroy them, right. Yeah, they mangle live plants. So we've never had good luck with that. Um, so we just kind of went with the artificial plants. It gives them some place to hide, something to climb on. Um, gives them a little bit more sense of security um, instead of trying to um, improve on our green thumb and actually growing something in the tanks. Well, they, they just don't seem to do well for us. Right, and and I have replaced all of my live plants in my mm -hmm. in my gecko cages to silk plants because they're yeah. just very low maintenance and very aesthetic. We try to go like somewhat um, naturalistic by using um, cork bark and uh, wild uh, wild collected uh, driftwood um, and then peat moss and everything. So we do have isopod cultures. Um, in so they these. are bioactive? Um, yes. Um, they're not set up as bioactive as true bioactive people would like to see, but 
they are a self-contained system, at least, to the point that um, the little critters take care of the poo and the food waste and everything, and it works out nice. There you go. Minimal cleaning. So you have a huge collection here. You have all these cages over here, shelves over there, cages over here, all the way over here. This is a really sizable collection of Chihuahua geckos. So what is the overall everyday care of a Chihuahua gecko? Um, for the most part, um, if you know anything about uh, crested geckos, um, keep them about room temperature, 70 to 74 degrees. If you're comfortable, for the most part, they're comfortable. Chihuahua, they like a little bit of higher heat, actually. Um, give them a hot spot. We use uh, like the xenon puck lights, um, the sort of stuff that like under cabinet um, type lights that throw off a little bit of heat. And you can see the girl in the back there that she's right up, right up in that heat. Um, those are about 130 degrees um, and they will bask right against it in about 90 degree or 95 degree heat at times. So keeping them a little bit warmer they tend to do better, um, especially breeding females they like that heat. Um, for the most part though we keep everything room temperature just the same with our crested geckos. Um, tank size is 18 by 18 by 24 for a pair um, at minimum for us. Uh, we try to keep uh, the breeding pairs in that size tank. You can always go bigger, obviously, uh, 18 by 24 by 24s, or some of the tall skyscraper type um, tanks are really good too. So as for people that are making that leap from crested geckos and lichianus into Chihuahua geckos, the feeding aspect of these guys is pretty much the same as those other geckos. It's pretty similar. Um, for the most part, we feed uh, a lot of the Rapashi and Pangaea diets. Um, they really, really like the Rapashi mulberry, but any of the flavors uh, seem to work. Um, and then the Pangea flavors also. We'll sometimes mix it 50-50, give them a variety. Um, we'll switch it up every week um, just to keep them feeding. Right. Um, the other thing with Chihuahua is that they, they really, really, really like live foods. Um, so if you throw them extra roaches and crickets, um, they are voracious eaters. Um, they really, really do like to eat live foods also, and it's good for them. Um, the extra calcium and everything for, for breeding females is good. So always dust, uh, dust your um, live feeders, gut load them properly, so then they're getting the most nutritious meals that you possibly can. We use little ceramic bowls, yeah. um, and this was just a little bit that we put in there last night. Uh, this pair did not appreciate this flavor, <laughs> but uh, that's all we do. We put it in a little ceramic dish um, or a plastic dish or something. Uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, right, right yeah, folks? absolutely. So you basically leave that in the enclosures for them at all times and then supplement them with insect diets. Uh, right, yep, and we feed our adults um, every three days um, it's at least twice a week but if we're throwing them uh, live insects or other feeders then um, we it'll be three three times a week that we feed them gotcha all right so before we say rattle on here and finish this video I just have to take a look at this female <laughs> now for this particular gecko what would that be called um, I'm not necessarily sure white uh, collar white collar yep just general white collar they look like living lichen moss um, their common name is actually mossy prehensile tailed gecko. That's right. Um, and actually, maybe that's something I could show you. Um, their tails, they can use like another, an extra appendage. Um, they do have the prehensile tip, the, the lamellae on the tip that they can grip with. Um, and they can actually hang just from that tail. So we don't have problems with them losing their tails like crested geckos. No, um, they are much more reluctant to lose their tail. Um, we've only ever had a couple lose them and that's during breeding where they're getting very rough with each other. Um, it's said that uh, Pine Island locale does not regrow their tail, uh, but a mainland will. Uh, which is interesting. That is interesting. Uh, this is Winnetka, a sub-adult female that we're raising up. Um, she's got a little bit uh, to go yet before we are, before we're ready to breed her. Gotcha. Look at that red on her. Man, that is just a beautiful gecko. So for all the people out there that don't have the $7,500 to spring for a high-end Chihuahua, what is a more affordable Chihuahua that they can get into? There is a pretty big range, obviously. I mean, we talked about the high end just a little bit ago, but um, for pet quality and things that you'll find at reptile shows, a lot of people have them online now. Um, they still do hold a little bit of a higher value just because they're, you're not producing nearly as many, and there's not many, as many sure. people that have them. 
but you could be looking in the four hundred um, to probably eight hundred dollar range pretty easily. But you can find the affordable ones down around the four hundred to five hundred dollar mark uh, quite readily. Gotcha. All right, so that's basically what a four hundred dollar chihuahua. chihuahua. Yo quiero Taco Bell. I knew I was going to do it, and I did it. All right, so this is typically what a four hundred dollar Chihuahua gecko would look like. So unfortunately, like uh, I mean, you're you're paying for quality just like you do for anything else. Sure. So it depends on uh, pattern, color, presence, or lack of a white collar or a lot of white. Uh, like I said earlier, the more white and the more patterning, it seems like the better. But something like this is more affordable, probably around the five hundred dollar mark. Um, grays, greens, um, some light pinks to this one, um, but you can find some that uh, have good color and everything for the four hundred to five hundred dollars. So everybody knows that in the ball python world, you know the prices fluctuate; mm -hmm. they go down, they go up. So what about the Chihua gecko market? Um, well, we've been working with Chihua for around, I think it was 13 or 14 years now. Um, and really the price has not fluctuated that much. You have the crazy spikes in the market for the high end animals. Um, but basically the same type of animal that we bought back 14 years ago, you can still get for the same price. We bought our first ones, um, from Alan Rapashi. Um, for I think for $500 um, and from Steve Jamelli for $500 um, and that same quality type animal right now would go for about the same value so over so the years really hold their value over the years they have really really held their value about the same um, until you have um, a large amount of people actually breeding them and producing them um, the market may see some saturation in time but, I mean, that's years and years down the road, though, uh, yet, I think. Um, for the most part, they do hold their value very, very, very well. So, Rattlers, I'd like to thank Crystal and Kyle for having me over once again. This collection is absolutely awesome. And as always, like this video and share this video. Hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to check out our Patreon and our sponsors, which are in the description below. And until the next reptile adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on.